Welcome to the latest in our 1-11 to series. Lee Dixon choosing a team of the best 11 players he played with, starting with his goalkeeper. Right, let's crack on then. So, this, first of all, the team of um, players that you played with, hmm. I think I can guess this, but we'll say it anyway, who's the goalkeeper? Well, it's David Seaman. Um, I don't think... John Lukic, by the way, was one heck of a goalkeeper. Um, and... Was when I came to the club, he was he was he was quite renowned as as being very quiet but safe pair of hands, and he John was a really quirky character. I I, I liked his sense of humour. He kept himself to himself. He used to go off and read his book when we were on tour somewhere. The lads would be going off to try and sneak a beer somewhere. Some of them, us, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and John would go off and read his book, and he was quite sensible, and uh, he was a senior pro than 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 the. Than the most of us, so he was the sensible one in the team, but he was a really good keeper. But then, obviously, it was the David Seaman era came just after that, and there was a lot of speculation, David coming to the club, and then all of a sudden the deal was off, and all the Arsenal fans was, were, were saying that Lukic is better than Seaman. That was the famous song that they used to sing, um, because the, um, David's deal, there was some technicality about why he wasn't coming, and all of a sudden it was off and it was on. He eventually came to the club and then, wow, what a difference um, he was playing against him to someone he, pl he played with. Because you see him, goalkeepers, in a completely different light. He was, uh, the presence that he had, it, it's quite difficult to explain presence because he, he's very quiet, David, behind. He very rarely says anything. But every now and again, you just hear this big, booming voice go, keepers, and you go, whoa, and you get out of his way. And then you wouldn't hear him for another 20 minutes Someone had bend one in the top corner and he'd just flick it round the post as if it was in training. And that, that was the... My biggest compliment for him was his presence and the fact that he made all the saves he made look really simple. Let's move on. I presume before we move on, and I've just given you the big build-up, it is a back four. Yeah. Yeah, that's all right then. Who's at right back? Well, it, it is the back four and I have to... Um, the, I, I have to put myself in and I, there's a reason for this. Two we haven't had too many do this, by the way. Two reasons for this. Somebody asked me about when I was doing this the other day, and they said, uh, so who's your team then? And I went, well, you know, uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I put uh, the right back's me. And they kind of went, well, you can't put yourself in your own team. I said, well, I have to put myself in the own team because I've never played with another fullback, another right back. It's always been me. So how can I put somebody else in? Because I've never played with them. The whole point of it is who I've played with. And... To, to my knowledge, I'm the best right back I've ever played with. Left back. Yeah, well, Nigel Winterburn, and I'll I'll stick my neck out here and I'll say that over my 20 years of being a pro footballer and numerous years leading up to that, and obviously now in the media talking about it and watching fullbacks, and I don't think I've ever seen a more consistent, hard-working. Uh, hard to beat um, warrior of a fullback in all my time, and you can throw names at me, and people will, and they'll, all the great fullbacks of the world, and Maldini, and players like that, and Ashley Cole was went on, in my opinion, to be uh, the. I thought Ashley Cole went on to be the best left back in the world, and it was a period of his career where there was nobody better for me. But I think still this guy, if I was if I was to have a one game where he said, right, your life depended on this game, put a back four together, Ashley Cole wouldn't be in it. And Nigel Winterburn would be in it because I, n I know exactly what I'm going to get and I know he would never let me down. Mr Arsenal, I guess, is next, is he? Yeah, the skipper is always going to be in a lot of people's Arsenal's teams, but I was lucky enough um, when I came to the club to, to bump into this um, colossus, as, as George Graham used to call him, um, he was very young when I first came to the club in sort of 88. He was, he was still captain. Um, but I saw the youth in his face. He was very uh, enthusiastic about his game. He was um, still a kid. He had a kid feel about him. And, but on a, when, they, when he went out on the pitch, he turned into this uh, almost um, giant of a man. He, he literally turned into a man on the pitch. 
And he'd come off and he'd be laughing and joking and having a giggle and turn into a, back into a boy again. And, and that obviously, um, you know, with his, uh, Tony's private life, and he, you know, he, he's talked about it regular and, and his off the field, uh, off the field antics and the way he lived his lifestyle off the, off the field was very, um, he, he was easily led, he was very boy-like. Boy but once soon as he got on a pitch, he turned into this incredible stature that, that everybody looked up to and go, wow. He almost like had two personalities. He, he turned into somebody who you could then go, right, OK, the, the boy's not there, now Tony, I, I've got problems, I'm going to start hanging a few on him because I've got problems over here with this. I've got Ryan Giggs, so I'd turn around to him and I'd say, Tony, I've got Ryan Giggs today, so I'm going to have to. You're going to have. We're not going to play our normal game. I'm going to have to give him some special attention because he's such a good player. And Tony would go, "Yeah, no problem. I've got it." And it, without even saying anything else to him, he would take his position up, knowing that I'm not going to be quite on the cover like I normally am because I've got probably the world's best left yeah. winger to look after. So he would go, "Right, okay." So, and he'd just take it on his shoulders. He wouldn't go, "Well, Dicko, I've got, you know, I've got Mark Hughes or I've got." A, you know, whoever it was, he, he'd just go, fine. So you could, I found myself dumping things on him in the game, going, Tone, have that, because I'm over here. And he'd go, sorted, and it would, and it would get sorted. And I'll tell a story that, in fact, it starts to make me feel a little bit emotional. My, in my last game for Arsenal, we were both retiring at the same time, and we were playing together, and he got himself in some really awful position. He got sucked into the hole, and he went missing, and the ball got knocked over the top. And I thought, oh, God, I'm going to have to cut. So I left my man, and I ran all the way back, covered and sweeped it back to the goalkeeper. And I come, I got him out of jail, really. And I, as I came running back, as I, as I ran past him, he went, Dicko. He said, you're one hell of a fullback. Do you know that? And I went, I looked at him, and I said, wow. Tony Adams, and it's the first time he'd ever said anything like that to me. Really? Because he'd always, he'd always been, we'd always been, yeah, well done, well done, Dicko, did it. He'd always been like that, because he was teammates and he was, we, got, we helped each other. But it was the way he said it, he almost knew, because we were coming to the end yeah. of it, it was the last season. And he wanted to, I don't know whether he intentionally wanted, but he, he told me in a way, to me, I took it, that he wanted me to know that that's how he felt about me. And, he, and we played together for, you know, 14 years. Um, was it fitting then in '98 that he actually he scored the goal? Yeah. Um, you know, I think I think everybody round the stadium, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, what two things? Steve Ball with a pass like that, and then Tony out of this this celebration. And there's no it's no coincidence that that is his statue outside. That it, the when you ask him about that, and I'm sure he told you about it. It was like almost like not relief, but it was just like it was the it was the coming together of everything that he'd gone through on and off the pitch um, that really made, epit epitomised him that, that goal. Because he could, I mean, he, he's never swung his left foot like that in his life before. Um, but it was, a, it was a brilliant moment. And I, I guess that's one of the iconic moments of, of Arsenal fans uh, down the years. They'll remember the Liam Brady goal when he curls it in the top corner. And that goal will get remembered. There'd be Dennis Bergkamp, Thierry Henry's and Wrighty's goals. But that one by Tony will, will resonate for years to come. You mentioned the pass from Steve Bold. Let's put him in and, yeah, we and complete the, uh, the back four. What, what, what was um, obviously still on the staff to this day? What, what was he like as a player and a fella? Well, I obviously played with, uh, with Boldy at, uh, at Stoke and um, George asked me about him because I signed in the February and George said to me in about the March, he said, we're looking at Stevie, um, Stevie Bold. And I went, sign him. Because he, uh, having played with him at Stoke, I knew what he was all about. And he, he was happy I went to Stoke because he was playing right back, which is, Boldy's not a right back. He's lots of things, but he's not a right back. And when I signed for Stoke, he moved into his normal position. And so uh, it was the best thing that ever happened to him uh, that I signed. And, and probably one of the best things that happened to me was when he signed for Arsenal. So because he, he just came in, fitted in. I think Everton were after him. And, and I said, to, you know, I, I kind of had a little word because we were mates. And I said, um, I think I'm not sure this class is as tapping up, but I think Arsenal might be looking at you, Stephen. <laughs> Don't go and sign for Everton. And he went, well, I'd love to come down to London. And he came down and he fit in amazingly well. 
George, as we knew each other, George obviously had an idea on how he wanted to, to build a back four and make it um, a solid back four for, for a base to, to play off. Um, and then we went, we then became very close, the four of us, because we, we worked on a daily basis. Um, Did you do a lot of work, the four of you, away from the rest yeah. of the team? Yeah, I mean, we, we would go off with George. George would send uh, the, the, the midfield and the forwards off with Theo Foley and do some, some uh, midfield and striking stuff. And he'd take the four of us without a goalkeeper and he would have a ball under his arm and he'd walk up and down the pitch saying, this is where the ball is, what are you going to do? Where are you going to go? And he'd walk, because he, George had a bad knee, so he couldn't run anywhere. So he'd walk over to, the, to Nigel Winterburn and, and we'd all have to shift over in our positions. And then the, the position, the distances between us had to you know, all be equal. And he would, didn't like big gaps and little gaps. We all had to be the same. If it was a little gap, we'd all be little gaps. And so we would move across the pitch and up and down with just following him walking around the pitch. And I mean, how boring is that? It was days and days of that. We used to do that, we'd probably do that three or four times a week for 15 minutes each, every time we did it. It was like, oh, we're doing that walking thing. But it's amazing, the ball comes over to somebody who was standing in a position where George had it under his arm with the ball at his feet on a Saturday and you'd look over and you'd, all you'd see is George with the ball under his arm and you go, well, when he's there, I know I have to be here. And I know if I'm here, that the, uh, that, Steve Bowles there and Tony Adams is five paces that way and two dropped in. So I'd know where he was without even looking at him. And that's how it became a, a, a regimented way of playing, that we knew everybody's position, we knew where to be. We, when the ball was in certain areas, if we had pressure on the ball, we would be in this position. And that's, that was down to George Graham. And, and also um, us four taking the information on board. It's quite easily for one of us to go, I'm not doing this, this is just... But we see the results on a Saturday. And that, that ability to be able to work out where you should be, like that, does not save you some running. Lee Dixon's 1-11, to as he continues to pick a team of the best 11 players he played with. Let's get into midfield. Who's the first gentleman in there? Well, Patrick, um, what can you say about this guy? When he... What did you think when he walked through the door for the first time? What have we signed? Because he was limping, he'd got a knee injury, I think he'd torn his cartilage, so he, he arrived on the first day, this guy turned up, he was six foot three, really, really tall and skinny, didn't look like an athlete um, or a football athlete, he looked more like a, I don't know, a high jumper or something. He, he didn't look very strong, he was limping on his leg, and I went, we've signed somebody who can't even run. And he didn't train for a, for a period of time, and then all of a sudden he sort of started coming into training. And then as soon as you th threw a ball at him, and you saw, because he was quite gangly, the way his style wasn't, he wasn't a fluid player in that respect. Um, the ball had sort of, didn't look as if it was completely under control at times, but as soon as he started to get to the pace of the English game, we then started to see this, um, this almost brute of a midfield player who, who had an engine on him. Always, having said that, I had an engine on him. He did, but he always looked tired. He was always breathing. I used to look at him and go, you look older than me. I said, you're a kid. You should be doing all... I said, I, I, I look fitter than you. And he, it was always a bit of a joke with him. You know, he'd, he'd come in after the game and I'd say, are you all right? And he'd go, oh, I'm so tired. And I said... I don't know if you know, but I'm like, I don't know how many, I don't even know how old he is now, but I must be 10 years older than you at least, um, even probably more. Um, but that was his, his way, he had a really quirky way of playing, but what a player. He took, he took games by the scruff of the neck and completely ran the midfield. Right, let's break the Arsenal monopoly. Yeah. See, this is difficult, quite easily to put Manu in, but um, the fact that we need a bit of creativity in the midfield. And this team, again, is, this is a team for, for, uh, for reasons to make a team, but also the odd individual has to go in there. Just You might say, I'm playing a 4-3-1-2 sort of formation. Well, of the analysis on that. Yeah, and you might say, <laughs> well, you, you know, you've left him out, or you might say, Skulls... I'm put, anyway, I'll put him in now, and then you can... Um, Far better players than me have said he's the best player I've ever played with or played against in midfield. Um, and so for me to hear all that about him and then... He, the thing is with Scolzi is when you put him in a team, 
to, to fans, they go, Skulls. Then I don't think they get it as much. United fans probably do. Um, but I don't think the whole of the, of the football world knows how good a player this guy was. I think he, they think, yeah, he was a good player. I think maybe that's pro probably because of his England career wasn't quite as... Do you know, he wasn't like... Played Ine that position a lot as well, yeah. wasn't he? He wasn't like Iniesta's career or mm. Xavi's career in Spain. There was always a comparison elsewhere. And you say, well, if he's that good, he should have done... You know, you can only play in the team you get picked for, for England. And for whatever reason, they didn't really... You know, they didn't set the world alight. So I think that's probably why. But if you ask any domestic player and international player who played against him, will say absolutely world class and this guy was world class no make no mistake about that talking of england who else is in midfield well i could there's no team without gaza he had a, he had a he had a, a brilliant ability to be able to make you lose your balance um chris waddle had it as well chris waddle had a, a he had an ability to just do something that you just went oh and once you lose your balance as a defender you, there's no coming back from that against these players at this level because they, they, that's all they're waiting for. They're just waiting for... It's almost like they're looking at you and they're just waiting for a little bit of um, light behind you that, that pokes through. Like, if you imagine a sun behind you and you move and you see the light. Once you see the light, they're gone. So they're just waiting for you to get off balance. So they, they throw a few shapes, they move the ball a little bit and you think, oh, I've got him, and then he'll do something. You go, oh... And the little light shines and he's gone. And that was him. He, he, could t he could put people on his backside, left, right and centre. The ability on the ball that he had and his strength. I mean, you've seen here, just the way he used to hold players off with his arms. He's, he's the strongest um, upper body of a midfield player I, I've ever played against. And luckily for me, I tried to stay away from him um, when I was playing against him. But when I played with him for England, he used to say. He used to say. He used to say to me in training. He goes, Dicko, come on, let's have it right now. Just give me the ball, okay? Because I'm a lot better than you. <laughs> and I used to go, good point. <laughs> I'll do my best. And I used to get it and just go, Gaza, where are you? Just give it him. Because that's how. That's how brilliant. And he'd only pass it to you if you were in trouble. And you'd only pass you could. You could then make was back to him. Right. Who's behind the front two then? Well. It's quite a good team, this, isn't it? It is. I'm very impressed. I forgot how to spell his name. Burkamp. Um, that goal against Newcastle he scored. You were on the pitch, weren't you? I was on the pitch, looking at afar, and I was sort of on the halfway line, sort of picking my nose at the time. <laughs> that goal, it was... When he did it, I, I couldn't work out what he'd done, because I was so far away... Certainly, the defender couldn't work out what he'd done either. <laughs> he, I mean, whoever thinks that was a fluke, just have a look at it again, because he knows exactly what he's doing. And I, actually, after the game, we came off the, uh, the pitch after the game, and I'd, there was a TV monitor, and I walked past, and they, they showed the goal, and I looked at it, and I went, oh. went in the dressing room, I said, Dennis, I need to ask you something. And he said, what? And as soon as he went, what? He knew what I was going to ask him, and he went, don't ask me. And I went, right, because I was going to say, did you mean that? Yeah. And he just went, sometimes things just happen. Just let it be. And I was like, that'll do for me. Went home, went home and said, he meant it, he meant it. I didn't even have to ask him, he meant it. And it was the best goal, I think, individual goal from a touch point of view I've ever seen in my life. And, uh, and somebody showed me a better one. Um, but he did that all the time in training. And the, the amount of times that he used to... Um, have a, have a, have a full-on fight battle with Martin Keown in training was kept me going for my last three or four years at Arsenal just to go to training and watch them two. Martin trying to kick lumps out of Dennis and Arsene Wenger standing on the side. We got Liverpool on the Saturday and on the Thursday, Martin would be kicking lumps out of him, trying to get the ball off him and Arsene going, no, Martin, no! Because <laughs> we obviously needed Dennis on the Saturday. Yeah. But it, Dennis was proper physical. He was one of those players in training that would stick his foot in, look after himself, and we had a... Both me and him were injured one week. Um, we'd missed a game and we were training with the reserves on the Thursday because they were doing a bit of extra. First team were having a, t uh, a rest. So Arsene said, Dennis Lee, go and train with the, with the young players, get a workout. So we went and trained with the work and we're doing an 8v8 
first team training was finished, so Arsene was walking over to watch us train. At this point, I tackled Dennis and fell on the floor, and Dennis stamped on me like that as I was on the floor, because he was angry, because I took the ball off him. Stamped on my shin. So I jumped up and I sort of pushed him like that, and as I pushed him, he turned, he turned around and just went, chinned me like this on the chin. This is in training on Thursday. We got Tottenham on the Saturday. Chinned me like that. So I've then laid one on him. In, this is training. All the lads are going, wait. And Arsene Wenger's walking over like this to, to look, watch his training. And me, and me and Dennis are standing there <laughs> going like this, swinging lumps out of each other. And he was going, no, as he came running over the thing. And we just sort of, we both looked at each other and they just burst out laughing. We'd give his, had, a, had a hug and got on with it. But that was Dennis. He, he would fight anybody for the ball. On even during the week, and that's that's the edge he had, and I don't think I think players who played against him knew that. Didn't always come across on on the on the pitch at times, but he, he could look after himself. Did he have everything, Lee? The the, the world uh, in, Inter Milan letting him go. They must have been the best team in the world because he was the best player I've ever played with against in training. Best player I've ever played in, the, and you ask all all the our teammates, everyone, Thierry Henry, Ian Wright, Tony Adams, everybody says the same player. Who's the best player? Dennis, you don't even have to finish the question. 10, DB10, every time. Wow, high praise indeed. Uh, let's move on to the strikers then. Who's up, who's up top first? This is looking nice as well. Well, I had to put Wright in, otherwise he would have killed me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't disagree with that either. Ian Wright... Uh, and again, some, some of these statements that I might come out with today, you might go, oh, right, best finisher, best finisher I've ever played with. So Thierry was a brilliant finisher. Dennis finished goal, finished anything. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about all round. He could head it, both feet. He could strike a ball. He could chip a ball. He could dink a ball. So any finish you want, like the one when he opens himself up, the, dri the driven one across the ground that he sometimes miss hits, sometimes he bobbles them in, and you go, well, he's not hit that well. Doesn't matter. He doesn't care how he goes in. Chips like that. He, he's, he's the best all-round finisher I've ever been around, let alone you know, even seen. To, to train with him, he lived for scoring goals. That was it. His life was, how many goals am we getting training? He, doesn't, he, didn't, he didn't even care what was coming on a Saturday. If we got Tottenham on a Saturday, Monday morning was the most important day because he would go, how many goals am I going to get from now until we play Tottenham? Can I get 15 in training? That's his goal. So every day he had a goal to see how many he could get. Who is up front with him in this mouth-watering team then? Well, probably the second best finisher next to Wrighty, Thierry Henry. Um, probably went on to become the most uh, dangerous striker in the Premier League, I would say, over his career. I think at his peak, I think he was, he was almost unplayable. And I think if you ask all the United defenders and, and, the, and the Chelsea defenders and all the, all the real good defences that he's played against, and I pretty much they will all say he was unplayable in a, in a period of time. He scored every type of goal as well. He wasn't prolific in the air by any means. Probably that was his weakness, headers. But running away on a break, even when, the, when, when he was outnumbered with... How many goals have we seen when he's been just running the length of the pitch with six shirts chasing him back and another three waiting for him? And he ends up getting a free shot on goal. He was just... His pace, he was, he was exceptional. And again, another... Another uh, interesting training sessions with Martin Keogh. Martin tried to kick him the whole time as well. There's a common theme. <laughs> <theme. laughs> um, so so uh, to, to play with him, and, and it's funny because when he came, we, we knew who he was. We'd not, he wasn't that famous when he no. came. Um, but we knew, we knew he'd come from Juve. We knew he was playing on the left side. He, he wasn't really in the team. He was like, we knew he was quick. And he turned up. And uh, we were like, right, OK. Straight away, first trainer, player signs, the first training session in a club is... You know. It's the one that you judge a player. He comes in and you straight away you see his touch and you go, oh, he can play. Or straight away you go, well, oh, I'm not so sure about him. And, and to be fair with Thierry, when he first came, you went, he's quick. And that, you kind of went, shooting practice, he'd, be, he'd literally be all over the place. He wouldn't hit the barn door. 
he was, and we all went, where's he play then? Is he, is he going to, where's, and straight away, Arsene was, oh, I'm going to play him down the middle. He's going to be, a, you know, a number nine. And we were like, really? He can't shoot. <laughs> he can run, but he can't shoot. <laughs> wow, how wrong was I? Um, and he then honed in on this ability to be able to score from anywhere. And, and he's, he, he's, he's finishing very similar type goals. Um, you know, he'd be break away, open himself up, slip it in that corner, always from that left channel, which is where he kind of grew up playing. Um, but as I said, you ask Gary Neville about him and players like that, they're scared stiff of him even now. You know, he's, he's immortal as far as Arsenal fans are concerned and his ability to single-handedly win games on his own. So, alongside Wrighty and with Dennis just behind, it's not bad, is it? Hi there, I'm Rebecca Lowe, studio host for NBC's coverage of the Premier League. Don't forget to hit subscribe to watch highlights all season long and tune in for Premier League mornings every weekend at 7 a.m. Eastern on NBCSN. And for more than 1,400 hours of exclusive Premier League content, make sure to visit NBCSports.com gold.